So this morning I'm in downtown Battle Creek. It's early on a Sunday morning. Behind me is part of the downtown district that once had a trolley car system way back in the early foundation days of this city. So I wanted to explore that with you today as part of a history of the downtown district of Battle Creek. The electric light railway car system was once called the Interurban, and it was a, an extensive network of trolley cars that ran much farther than you would ever imagine. So come along and join me. Let's explore this very interesting part of history of Battle Creek, Michigan and Calhoun County. As I tell this story, although it is centered around Battle Creek, it is really a story about Michigan and its first rapid transit system to connect cities all across the Lower Peninsula. We'll begin today's journey by once again delving into Tales of Battle Creek by Bernice Bryant Lowe. In both national and local histories, there are words and phrases that pop up with new meaning and then fade out again with hardly a trace in anyone's memory. Car barn is such a term. It belongs only in the era of streetcars and interurbans encompassed in Battle Creek by the years 1883 to 1932 less than half a century. The first street cars were pulled by horses along tracks, and there had to be a place to keep both the cars and the horses. What more appropriate than a car barn? Later on, horses were replaced by electronically powered motors, but the cars themselves were still housed in a car barn. After building a street railway system in 60 days time in Jackson, Michigan, a man by the name of A.J. White came to Battle Creek to try to do the same. A franchise was obtained by four enthusiastic individuals, V.C. Collier, George E. Howes, E.C. Nichols, and Clement Wakeley. Horse cars were ordered from a Philadelphia manufacturer. In June of 1883, track was laid and the Battle Creek Railway Company, incorporated with White as president and general manager, went into operation offering the first streetcar line in the city of Battle Creek. It's important to put the context of the street cars into the timeline of history. The first transportation systems were the horses pulling the street cars on tracks on specific routes throughout the city. Starting in the late 1800s, the first mass production automobile was not introduced until 1908 with the Model T Ford. So this was years and years before as the major transportation system that was being duplicated across the nation in various cities. Here's an example of a similar system in Washington, D.C. Prior to the introduction of the streetcars on the tracks, as the, you see in these photos, the major means of transportation around a community was either by walking on foot long distances to a location, going by horseback, perhaps by wagon or carriage. In fact, a lot of the older homes around Battle Creek, you might see smaller garages and wonder why they had such small garages attached to these older homes. Well, those were actually carriage houses. Carriages were much more narrow than modern day automobiles. So the streetcar system existed in other parts of the country. It was just introduced into Battle Creek in 1883. The initial operation consisted of six cars and 24 horses and six drivers. The men were considered four times tougher than the horses as each horse worked 16 miles and each car and driver worked 64 miles per day. The first summer there was a Grand Army of the Republic encampment, a reunion of soldiers and sailors from the Civil War which was a four-day event in the fairgrounds near Manchester Street. The horse car line was not quite run into the ground at the time, but it carried 26,000 passengers in that same week. At a nickel a ride, the company was financially on its feet almost immediately. The initial routes were along what we know today as East Michigan Avenue, also on Elm Street, Green Street, West, 
and East Main Street, and then west on North Washington Street to the sanitarium. As time went on, more routes were added from Main and Jefferson, which are today's Michigan and Capitol Avenues. They went out to Fountain and Upton Streets, and it even extended out to Gogwak Lake in 1888. Although the route to Gogwak Lake was run only during the summertime, and there were days when men had to get out and walk up the hill between Fountain and Burnham Streets when the loads were too heavy for the horses. A new Battle Creek Electric Railway Company, largely Chicago-owned, took over the old line on June 1, 1891, and rebuilt it to accommodate heavier cars. Poles had to be placed and trolley wires strung all throughout the tracks and the lines. The entire operation was far more complicated than A.J. White's horse car line a decade earlier. People remembering the old electric streetcars would tell stories that would include stops required when the trolley wheel slipped from the wire. Then the operator had to get out, go to the rear of the car, and with a rope that was attached to the trolley bar and the car, jiggle the grooved wheel around until it was replaced properly. A Halloween prank for big boys was tripping the trolley. They ran behind the cars and jerked on the rope so that the wheels left the trolley wire. The lights in the car went out, power was was detached and the operator repeated his task of connecting the trolley wheel to the power line. As the electric cars were introduced, of course they were larger so they could hold a lot more passengers, so the lines for the transportation system became more expansive. And they were no longer called street cars, they were called interurbans. And their schedules and timetables were printed regularly in the newspaper. Now it's important to note that the interurbans were distinctly different from the Grand Trunk Railroad. The railroads were here before the interurbans, but at this stage in history, the railroads were used for more long distance transportation and primarily used for hauling freight and materials. The interurban offered a lower cost transportation system for passengers, and the interurban lines went out through rural areas and connected cities like Marshall, Kalamazoo, Jackson, Detroit, even as far over as St. Joseph. The word interurban, of course, means between cities. As the trolleys would go out into the rural areas, they would no longer be connected to the lines. They would operate off of a third rail, which was used as the power supply outside of the city. An additional feature of the interurbans is that the companies that were running the lines included a wood stove inside each of the cars, which revolutionized travel about town because passengers could stay warm between destinations, which previously, riding about town or walking about town, was a cold and daunting experience in the middle of a Battle Creek winter. Local businesses began advertising their business location in proximity to the interurban. Businesses downtown that were near the waiting station would be certain to tell in their advertising their proximity to that location. As the interurban expanded out to Urbandale, this advertiser included an entire map on how to get to Urbandale in his Urbandale store on the interurban rails. Real estate agents out towards Waddles Park selling new development out there at Green Acre also included in their advertisement the benefits of living out that way because there was an interurban line. Of course, that was the route that headed towards Marshall. Over the years, there were many different companies that operated different sections of the interurban between different cities, and they worked out cooperating agreements they were forever improving and changing the routes to improve service. In fact, here's one story that I came across about an individual that took the interurban from Battle Creek all the way to Flint, Michigan, and described their experience as being very pleasant and being able to get to Jackson in one hour and 20 minutes and transfer at that branch to continue on to Flint, Michigan or Detroit. The interurban had tracks all over the city, down Jefferson Avenue, connecting to Lake Avenue. It followed Maple Street out to Verona. Maple Street is now known as Capitol Avenue Northeast. There were even crossing sections of the interurban in downtown 
Battle Creek. The Interurban, although a great success for its time, was not without its problems. In 1907, there was a strike between the company and the motormen and the conductors that went on for a while and delayed the lines. In 1918, there was a serious blizzard that happened that shut down the interurban lines in January. And then over the years, there were several incidents and accidents, everything from interurban cars crashing in with each other, hitting wagons, horses, pedestrians, as well as the introduction of the automobile. There were many mishaps with cars crossing in front of an interurban and an interurban not stopping at an intersection and hitting cars and so forth. A fascinating article I came across that was published in 1935 was about George Stoddard, who was then the chief of police for Albion, but prior to becoming chief of police, he had served as a motorman for the interurban from 1906 to 1926, 20 years in service. His route was an 11 hour stretch from Albion to Jackson, then back to Kalamazoo through Battle Creek and then back to Albion. He describes that he often had no time to eat. In those days from 1906 to 1926, Chief Stoddard recalled that many times it was necessary to lean his head out the window in the winter to see because there was no device to melt the ice on the windshield. He also described that the in winter the third rail and the tracks were so covered with ice and sleet that flashes from the third rail burned his eyes. He also described that the busiest times on the interurban during his years of service was during World War I. Cars ran every hour at that time, a local and a limited alternating routes, and still, he says, it was impossible to carry all the passengers. He said on one trip from Jackson, there was scarcely any room for the motorman. When he started working for the interurban, he was earning 21 cents an hour, and when he retired, he was earning 45 cents an hour. He described over his years of service that he only had three accidents that he recalled. One was where his interurban car hit a buggy and killed a man and a woman, passengers in that buggy. He said it was a blind crossing between two hills and no view for the motorman or the buggy driver. Another time, an old fashioned coal burning engine with a threshing machine and water tank trailing obstructed the crossing near Galesburg. Chief Stoddard suffered a cut artery on his arm in the accident. And the third accident that Chief Stoddard remembered occurred when the motorman of another car became too busy talking to his company superintendent, who was riding with him, that he forgot the orders about a work car on the road, which Chief Stoddard was riding in. So near the switch that was supposed to happen, they had a collision. The result was that he had six weeks of vacation with pay recovering from his injuries. Upon retiring from the interurban service, he became chief of police in Albion within a few short days. And at the time of that article, he'd been in service as chief of police for 10 years. In Marshall, the interurban went through downtown and it went around the park where there's a fountain today. And just past that was the interurban depot, right about here. And today there's a historic marker in Marshall commemorating the history of the Interurban Depot, and it tells you a little bit of the story of the Interurban in its days of operation. The electric Interurban was well named. Interurban means between cities. It was hailed as the final answer to Michigan's needs in rapid transit. The cars were shaped like railroad coaches, were longer and heavier than streetcars. They collected fares, handled crowds, and during peak periods of service could handle 11,000 passengers each day. Townspeople rushed to own stock in interurban lines when they were being constructed. However, by the early 1930s, it was becoming more clear that the automobile offered a lot more freedom in transportation, was more readily available to the individual families, and the interurban itself showed a decline in passenger transportation and became regarded more as a hazard on the roadways, so they were eventually phased out. And this slower transportation system was replaced by motorized buses, which are so commonly seen today. The last interurban to Offer service in Battle Creek was in 1932.
Detroit was the earliest city in Michigan to introduce streetcars in the 1860s. They too followed the path of introducing the electric rail cars or interurbans. They also phased them out in the early 1930s. However, they revived the electric streetcar service in 1976, and that system ran and was in full operation until 2003 when it was phased out. Today, electric streetcars or trolleys are most often associated with cities like New Orleans or San Francisco. But there are cities like Philadelphia with more modern electric streetcar systems and there are also plans to reintroduce them into New York City for limited routes as they offer a more eco-friendly alternative to modern transportation systems. Now in modern terms, the technical definition of electric streetcars are those that are propelled by onboard electric motors and require a trolley pole to draw power from an overhead wire. Trolleys, on the other hand, look like regular buses, but they are completely electric and have twin poles on the roof of the bus that draw power from double overhead wires. But in common language, they are all electric streetcars and people frequently use interchangeably the words trolley and streetcar to describe this form of transportation. And looking back, they were an amazing technological wonder in the times when they were introduced. So in closing this story, let's take a look at some slides of downtown Battle Creek and the interurban. And the next time that you walk downtown, try to remember these images and see if you can find traces of this history, which today is but an echo of the past. With the culture becoming more and more environmentally conscious, perhaps we will see a return of the electric streetcars and the interurban at some point down the road in the future. Wouldn't it be wonderful to take a ride on one of these again and go full circle with this historic form of transportation from our city's past? Well, that's going to do it for today's tour of this fascinating point of history of the interurban in downtown Battle Creek. I hope you found it interesting. If you liked today's video, please take a minute to leave me a like, leave me a comment, tell me what you thought about it, and share the video with others. And of course, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.